Highway racing. It's something akin to a lost art. While there are audiences still keeping the spirit alive, it's not something you'll necessarily hear within the mainstream consciousness, with the most successful example being the Wangan Midnight series in the arcade, kept alive and going by its very dedicated fanbase. But being an arcade racer, you'll have to shell out quite the fortune just to be somewhat competitive in the community. The only alternative is to either wait for indie devs, mod Assetto Corsa, or dig into past games via emulation. A while ago, I made a video about the beginning of the Tokyo Extreme Racer series. It was a somewhat interesting experience, partially because I wasn't really aware of this highway racer subgenre. Sometime after this, you guys recommended another game from the same developers called Import Tuner Challenge. Originally, I didn't know that this was essentially just Tokyo Extreme Racer 4, or as the Japanese name suggests, the 10th game in the franchise. But since this game was made exclusively for the 360, and it was also around the time when I started getting into Xenia emulation, I decided why not check it out. Though a bit of fair warning, if you want to experience this using emulation, be sure to speed up the emulator anytime the game takes you to the garage. So basically every end of the day and every time you beat a boss. Otherwise, the game will send you to the Shadow Realm. This game came out in 2006, same year as another Japanese highway racer called Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. The title was supposed to be Genki's entry to the new and shiny 7th gen console, but it resulted in the series getting discontinued and the internal team disbanded. This game was the only title Ubisoft got a full hand for publishing. Previously, they would only handle the EU or PAL versions. Speaking of previous versions, how does this fare compared to the very first game in the series? Compared to the humble beginnings of a very simple and straightforward arcade racer, what we got on our hands here is mostly the same. Well, at least for the gameplay loop, it is mostly the same. You go out, flashbang some random person on the road, and start racing them across the long and winded Tokyo highways, before taking massive W's to trick out your ride even further. Clear and simple form of progression. No need to tweak, change or overcomplicate things. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The major differences are in the details around the game. Each series introduced new mechanics and systems and a story, with each entry having a very similar formula of you're a complete newcomer to the scene, now beat everybody. With some variation like a gang war, the king going missing, etc. It's a story fit to serve as the already pretty simplistic gameplay loop. Though in the case of this game, the story does get interesting with a lot more twists and turns than what would be expected from the series. Starting the career, you're given a certain amount of cash and a number of cars to select. But not just any cars, we got licensed cars, and importantly, Toyotas. While all the cars are available from the start, you're not gonna have enough cash to drive an A34 right off the bat. And once you know it, the first challenger is here. This race serves as an introduction to the kind of races you'll be doing throughout most of the career. The usual SP battles aren't the only thing available with the addition of point-to-point -point races, a more classical approach to sprint races. Beating the tutorial, the guy starts talking to you, expressing his admiration for your driving abilities and wishing you good luck in your journey, properly opening the game for you to explore. Similar to the other games in the series, progression are separated by stages. Each stage opens a portion of the highway, adding more road to race on while gradually increasing the difficulty with faster opponents. For the most part, races are easy, but in traditional Genki fashion, some opponents can be pretty deceptive with their difficulty, and when you get these kinds of opponents, things can get a little bit intense. Midnight Cinderella! This will be interesting. I'm fast as fuck, boy! Oh my good lord, the Arctic State is fast. Unless the traffic slows her down. Vital signs critical. Traffic coming in clutch. Yes! Bye bye! Yes! 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 No! 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 Looking doable, but she's already coming back. Corners is where I have the advantage, but she's coming back for more. Oh, <laughs> we beat her! <laughs> Holy shit! Some of you may think this is rubber band, the same kind that was in the first game, but I'm not sure it's entirely the case. While I'm certain there is a form of rubber band in this game, it's not as severe as the original games or any previous mainline TXR games. In fact, Midnight Cinderella is an anomaly as the game boasts the lowest difficulty when compared to any other TXR game. Putting the drift games aside with the AI's instability to cope with corners, this will be a disappointment for fans who are looking forward to this game and were fans of TXR 0 or 3. The R34 with the way Nitrous works in this game completely trivializes everything, even the final boss of the game, Snake Eyes. In a 
franchise where the major bosses are infamous for their insane rubber band and instant acceleration. Midnight Cinderella is one of the many bosses you'll encounter. Defeat every boss in a stage and you'll unlock new areas of the highway and the next set of bosses, including their own cars, though they're pretty steep for the price, but hey, at least they got some neat visual options, especially this Evo 10 concept you can turn into the rally version. The opponents themselves are one of the most interesting aspects of the game. The usual opponents you meet would have stories of their own from their motivation to become a street racer or why they formed and joined the crew. A team started by men who drive the fresh fish from the port to the fish markets. Currently their biggest problem is that fishy smell that gets on their clothes transferring over to their car seats. The grandfather, a former test driver for Nissan, created a team fearing that his son's family was growing apart. He enlisted all the members of his son's family to join the team to force them to interact with each other. A goth type team that unleashes flashy colors on the metro. Thought to be a three girl team, but... What the f the ones you meet in parking areas are even more interesting since you can basically interact with them. See how they react when you challenge them to a race and then witness how many gallons of copium a single person can consume within 0 to 60. These parking areas also house some of the most bizarre characters in the game, commonly known in the series as Wanderers. They're in a sense mini-bosses. To challenge them you need to fulfill their super specific criteria. The annoying bit about them is they don't always make it obvious what these criteria are. Like some of them can be super direct, like this one chick that won't race me as long as I have a spoiler installed on my car. But then others are super obscure and just outright cryptic with their wants. Like buddy, can you be more specific? You're making me feel like I'm playing an Ace Attorney game here. These guys are the reason why 100%ing any TXR games becomes a living nightmare. Though you do get some neat references for some of them, like the super goofy ah racer that uses this Gundam inspired body kit. And of course, the Wong and Midnight references. It's tradition to get the Devil Z in the series at this point. Even the Drift spin-offs got them as well. Most of the rivals are split further by their active time, so some crews or wanderers will only show up either during nighttime, midnight, or daybreak. Though going back a bit, challenging rival crews can get super interesting, especially when you're outside of the parking areas. You can get jumped by another member of the crew and in some interesting cases they'll join you mid-race turning into a 1v2 situation or even a 1v3 race. Beat every crew member and the leader will come out and challenge you personally. And sooner or later, even the big boys will approach you too. Winning races will also provide a cash flow for upgrades, chain up some dubs and the cash reward will multiply. Get a loss or draw and the multiplier breaks. The multiplier isn't the only thing to watch out for. The game also contains a trap with oil wear and engine temperature. They don't even tell you about this one unless you got the upgrade grades to monitor both. Race too much in a single night and the car performance will drop. Mixed with the win multiplier, are you willing to race one more rival with less performance for some extra cash or call it a day? Well it would be a risk factor but you don't really lose money when losing so I guess it's a risk if you care about a perfect win percentage. Your nickname becomes another thing that changes based on performance. I'm not entirely sure what changes this, like if your actions during a race alters the name change you get, but it's seems to be that way, so you probably want to keep winning if you don't want to be known as skill issue. In a way the player name is some sort of achievement tracker, which kind of makes it unique especially back then when game achievements were only starting to be popular with the masses. There's only one way to keep that dub ratio as high as possible. You gotta pump up that shitbox, which means you gotta rack up lots of dubs and you gotta keep that car at top shape. Performance upgrades are quite the regular stuff, pick parts with higher performances and you get more power. Power. You know the usual linear upgrade systems. The visuals are where things get interesting. The basics are you got body parts and decals but then we got some extra options like the GOG for both the oil and temperature. They're not just an addition to the UI, they also count as an interior upgrade. Even this game has an interior view, probably the only one in the series if I'm not mistaken. Playing this game based on release order, the car counts in this one will severely disappoint you. The previous game in the series contains a couple of hundred cars with European
European brands added into the mix, but this game only has 18 cars and they're all Japanese brands. Though that's not counting the boss cars, which would probably increase the car count to 30-ish. Despite the disappointing car roster, it does somewhat make sense as a lot of the low-powered cars in the Drift series wouldn't really fit a much faster game like the mainline TXR games, but this game also had less cars than TXR 3 from 3 years ago, which just like Drift 2 had over 100 cars and even included European brands as well. The most reasonable explanation I can think of is due to this game having an interior cam. They had to remodel the cars from scratch and with a tight schedule with how many games Genki released in 2005, it's no wonder they had to reduce the car variety drastically. But now there's the elephant in the room, which I want to address. The game was released exclusively for the Xbox 360. You may be thinking, what is wrong with that? Well, first off, the series has mainly been a PlayStation title, with the first few exceptions being on the Dreamcast. So they already got fans from the brand alone, which kind of makes it baffling for them to make the switch to Xbox for this generation. It's likely they chose the 360 for Import Tuner Challenge as a direct response to the abysmal experience of working on the PlayStation 3 from other studios. It was so bad even Polyphony had to spend too much time tinkering with the machine. But on the positive side, the UI designed to mimic the Xbox characteristics looks pretty cool. Then there's the absence of the Wong and Speedline. Look at that! So excited to drive there, and it doesn't open up. Yeah, you heard that right. A highway racer fully inspired by the Wangan Midnight Cities has no Wangan speed line. They even have the junction ready, but after completing the game's story, it's not unlocked. Did Ubisoft force them to rush the game out, or was there, like, legal problems happening in the back? I am not sure. Feel free to mention in the comments if you know the answer. Including Nagoya and Osaka highways, which were available in TXR3, they were instead replaced by Shibuya and Shinjuku highway sections. But regardless, I think it's time we go back to talk about the game's story. With each boss defeated, they'll start talking to you like a normal person for once, and Bloodhound will approach you and talk about the Speed King. Before we continue, I'd like to provide the chance to any of you who are gonna give this game a shot and want to experience the story mostly blind to skip this part of the vid to avoid spoilers. Remember that old guy you beat a long, long time ago? Yeah, that guy is Motoya Iwasaki, the Speed King. Okay, I'll be honest, this doesn't really feel like a big twist, especially to those of us who have seen his name in the previous games. Genki wasn't being subtle about it either with Platinum Prince's description of the Speed King's current car and the fact that his car has every Emperor as the nameplate. I do really appreciate the continuity from the intro cutscene as he was last seen in Drift 2 using a Subaru WRX STI. As the story goes, he ruled the highway with his gang until tragedy struck. While he was so busy being the king of the highway, his girlfriend passed away in the hospital, causing him to blame himself for not being there for her and slipping into a deep depression. Thus, a decision was made he would disappear from the scene completely. Until very recently, the passion of racing begins once more. Long story short, that was when he encountered you, the player. With his identity not known, he still refuses to reclaim the throne, leaving Bloodhound to cheer you on to finally beat Snake Eyes, the leader of Phantom 9 and current ruler of the highway scene, which places us at the final stage with 9 whole bosses. But luckily Genki isn't so daft as to make you raise them one by one, as some of the bosses will challenge you in a 1v2 or 1v3 race, which may result in a more difficult challenge for faster progression. Beat all of them and that's it. You are now the Speed King and the first credits roll, which only leaves you with the Wanderers and some stray opponents, gangs left for a full 100% completion. But yeah, that's pretty much it for Importuner Challenge, the final game by Genki and no I will not count the failed mobile games. Certainly a fun experience despite being one of the weakest titles in the series, according to the fans that is. And it's a massive shame to what happened to Genki and the subgenre overall, though unlike most of these old developers, Developers, Genki is actually still around as a Pachinko software developer. I honestly don't know if that is a fate worse than death, but hey, at least people there didn't lose their job. I hope at least. Despite this, a return is very unlikely. The subgenre on its own is just generally not mainstream enough to be profitable, unless they go the arcade route like Wonga Midnight, but then it'll most likely lose the charm and have to compete with an already popular and successful game. So don't get your hopes up for Genki to return, but you should pay attention to some of the indie devs that are trying to tackle this subgenre. 